Hello friends and welcome back to PG Prototypes. You're going to have to excuse me today, I've got a bit of a raspy voice as I've been a bit ill this past week. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Hilton for proper chuffed for plugging my channel on his last video. I'd also like to thank him for his encouragement and support in getting my channel going again. I really would never have thought about it unless he pushed me to take that next step. I want to say another huge thank you to all of you that liked and subscribed to my channel. I really, really appreciate it and I can't even begin to tell you how much it means to me that you want to watch this content. It's been a huge morale boost in preparing this week's video. On this week's video, I'm going to show you how I did the layout wiring along with the DCC system that I chose to use for this particular layout. And finally, I'm going to show you how I used servos to control my points. So with all that said, let's get back to the layout. The next step I need to tackle on the layout is wiring. Now this is definitely not the most fun thing to watch, but it is very necessary. Good track work and wiring are the foundation of a good layout, and it's always important to remember that no matter how good your scenery looks, if your trains run poorly, you will probably lose interest in the layout, especially if it's a small shunting layout. You're not going to be able to get away with running your locos fast over bad track work, so it needs to work well from the start. I started by using a small paintbrush to apply flux to the rail. You only need a small amount and where the flux goes, the solder goes, so don't go crazy with it. The flux helps to clean any dirt and impurities off the rail and facilitate solder flow. This allows you to get a better joint between your connector wire and your track and this is exactly what we want. Good connections equal good power delivery. I apply my soldering iron directly to the rail and let it heat that surface up so that we can get a good connection. You'll notice a little puff of smoke as the flux heats up. When the surface is hot enough, I apply a small amount of solder to the rail and this is going to be the point that I attach my wire to in the next step. I'm trying to use up as many old supplies as I can for this build just to use up material that's been sitting stagnant in my workshop for years. I'm using old network cable for my feeder wires. The layout will have a very low current draw as it's only going to be running one loco at a time, so I figure that it doesn't require anything more heavy duty than this. I put a 90 degree bend in the wire in order to make it easier to attach to the track. I feed the wire through the small hole that I drilled and in order to keep the track from overheating too much and melting the sleepers, I put a big weight on the track to act as a heat sink. If you're wondering where I got this weight from, there was a period of time that I did garden trains and I removed this massive weight from a G-scale locomotive in order to fit radio control gear in it. And I always just hung on to it because it comes in handy as a paperweight. And I found that it's very handy in this particular application as it draws a lot of heat from the track. Once everything's in place, I push the wire up against the track and I apply heat with my soldering iron. I hold it for a few seconds to make sure that the solder melts on the wire and on the track. And I just hold it there for a few seconds afterwards to make sure that the joint is stable. After I make sure that my joint is secure, I pull the rest of the wire through the table to make sure that everything looks neat and tidy. I take a damp cloth and I rub over this joint to make sure that I clean up any excess flux that was left over from the soldering process. As high octane and riveting as the soldering process is, I'm going to move on to the next step of the process just so I can keep everyone's sanity intact for the rest of the video. I worked my way through the rest of the layouts until all the feeders had been soldered in place. If we have to get technical, the amount of feeders I added was overkill, but I'd rather have too many than too few. Something I didn't mention in the previous video was that I insulated all the frogs on all the points. I prefer this approach as it eliminates the potential for wheel shorts and if something does go astray, it's easy to isolate a section for troubleshooting. When I was done, I flipped the layout on its side and I gathered my wiring together, cable tied it and then connected all the wires to the relevant screw terminal connectors. I used a heavier gauge wire as a bus wire to connect the three terminals together. My command station will connect into the central terminal at a later stage. With everything connected, it was time to test my wiring. It's totally fine to connect a command station and just see if there are any shorts, but I prefer to do it with my multimeter first. This extra step may seem trivial, but I'd prefer to fault find this way instead of destroying an expensive piece of electronics for no reason. 
I set my meter to continuity and start by checking to see if there's been a cross connection anywhere along the line. My wiring passed this test, which was surprising to me, as in the past I always seemed to cross contact somewhere along the line. Next, I check that all the left rails are connected to each other and that all the right rails are connected to each other. Everything looked good, so the next step was to test this out and run a loco on the track. I absolutely love this part of layout building because it's the first breath of life into a new layout. Even after so many years in this hobby, I still get excited to fire up a layout. The magic of model trains has always been smooth operation and detail for me, and it just never gets old. I absolutely love this step. For this layout, I'm using a Roco Lockmouse R3 as a controller with a 10764 command station. It's an older unit, but it will work perfectly for this layout, and the major bonus is that it had been in storage for a while, so I'm sticking true to my goal of using the unused from storage. There are downsides to this controller, and I will get into that at a later stage. My test loco is a Hornby Class 8 with a factory fitted ESU lock sound decoder. I will also spend some time focusing on this loco and other locos that will call this layout home in a later video. So after some thorough testing, the layout passes with flying colours. The 08 was able to access all the sidings and ran smoothly over all the point work. I chose not to power the frog separately as I feel the standard configuration is reliable enough for my purposes. With everything running well, my motivation kicked up a notch to get to the next step. Traditionally, I used Pico Solenode point motors to switch my points. A coil on either side of the unit is powered to create a magnetic field that pulls the switch rod to the relevant side. There's nothing wrong with these. They are reliable and they are tried and tested. When a coil is powered, the point snaps into place. The sound of a point motor clicking into position most definitely has a therapeutic effect, in my opinion. The downside of the motors for me is that you can't control the speed at which they switch a point. The snap is the snap. You get what you get. The cost element is another downside at the moment. In South Africa, at least, they will set you back 200 Rand a motor, which converts to roughly £8 a piece. In comparison, a servo comes in at just over £1 per servo, or 30 Rand for us locally. There are three wires that control the servo. A ground, a 5 volt feed and a signal wire. Every aspect of its movement can be controlled and for my purposes I want slow speed and specific range of motion. I started experimenting with servos at the end of last year and to be honest I don't think I'm ever going to go back to solenoids. I love the slow speed action and the sound of the servo switching a point is great. I run my servos through a DCC setup on my shelf layout, but on this layout, they'll just be controlled by a toggle switch and an Arduino board. I have limited experience with Arduinos, but I do have a basic understanding and I have played around with them for quite a few years. If you haven't experimented with one, I highly recommend getting a starter set and exploring its capabilities. At its simplest level, it has input pins and output pins. The user uploads codes through the Arduino interface and gets the board to perform output operations in relation to the input signals. As I mentioned earlier, the servo requires a 5 volt feed, a ground as well as a signal cable. I'm going to connect the servo cables to the corresponding pins on the Arduino. I will use pin 9 as my signal pin. I used some jump leads that I got in my starter set to hook the servo up to the Arduino. Now that I've connected my servo as an output device, I need to connect my toggle switch to be an input device. When the toggle is switched on, the servo must move to one position, and when it's switched off, the servo must return to its start position. I connect one of the wires to ground and the other to an input pin. Now that the wiring is complete, I can focus on loading some code onto the board to get it to control the server in the way that I want. I have seen many people shy away from ChatGPT, but it's a very simple tool and it eliminates the fear of looking unknowledgeable when speaking to an expert in reality. You simply ask it what you would like and it guides you on your path.
I noticed a lot of sarcasm and hate on many of the Arduino forums. People getting frustrated at beginners like myself because we don't understand the nuances of coding. Skip this hate altogether and go straight to ChatGPT. It was helpful and actually guided me along the process as you will see in the next segment. I write out exactly what I'd like the end goal to be. In this case, I told ChatGPT that I want the servo signal to come from pin 9 and I want the toggle to feed into the board on pin A5. It's best to type out exactly what you want, but if you don't, you will work through the process with ChatGPT and it will adjust the code as you give it feedback. I also specify a start and an end point in degrees depending on the state of the toggle switch. The numbers I chose are arbitrary, but the difference between the numbers is the amount of motion I would like the servo to have. From previous experience, I know that the board has the ability to eliminate the need for an external resistor, so I asked ChatGPT to add this to the code. So I'm not convinced that AI will become supreme ruler of humanity, but I would have no clue if ChatGPT included some type of world ending code in my model train project. So I decided to kiss up to it a little bit with some humor. I love the fact that these AI engines have humor built into them. What you haven't seen in this video is the five attempts I had before this trying to spell out my code correctly. And each time that I did it, it gave back an even more humorous response. Okay, so now we can see that ChatGPT wrote some code for me. It has included a code overview and it even has a wiring overview. It really has the ability to take you through any process step by step and I highly recommend that you take advantage of this type of AI engine. You can see all the details I've requested are included in the code. Even if you didn't understand the code, you could use your input numbers to identify what each line of code does. Every time you receive an answer to your question, it will also prompt you for additional relevant information. I love this feature because there are times I forget details of a process and ChatGPT reminds me to consider the things that I overlooked. I upload the code to my Arduino and I give it a test. The general concept works, but it's way too fast. Back to my ChatGPT window for some adjustment. I explain the problem to ChatGPT and even with my spelling mistake, it understands what I want and makes the necessary adjustment to the code. I upload the new code and give it a try again. Definitely a better speed, but it still needs to be slower. I make the necessary delay change in the code and I test again. And with a little tinkering, I now have my server running the exact way that I want it to run. Now that I know the code works, I can move on to fine tuning it for eight servo motors. I used the same process with ChatGPT, but this time I explained I wanted eight toggle inputs and eight servo outputs. The code was generated, but the next important step is to configure the actual board for multiple servo use. Running a test with one servo is fine, but it's not good practice to power your servos directly from the board. Instead, a five volt feed should be separately connected to all servos. It's important to note that there are so many different combinations when it comes to Arduinos. Servo control breakout boards are readily available and they do exactly this. They separate the power to the servos and then they have dedicated three pin servo connectors for you to connect your servos directly to the board. If you did this exercise in South Africa, you'd be looking at around eight pounds for an Arduino Nano and the servo breakout board together. That is a heck of a cheap way to run points easily. I had a spare breakout board in my toolbox for an Arduino Uno, so I decided to transform it into a servo board. I added eight three-pin servo headers and a female power connector for the five volt feed. My soldering isn't great, but it does the job here. The third pin of each of the servo connectors has been connected to the relevant Arduino pin to send a signal to the servo. I've connected all the middle pins to the 5 volt positive input and all the ground pins to the ground of the power supply. The details I found online also mentioned that the ground should be connected to the ground of the Arduino. Toggle switches will be mounted in a control panel and they'll be connected to the screw terminals on the relevant pins using wires. With all the physical connections made, I now have an 8 servo board to control all the points on the layout. The possibilities with this hobby are endless, but there are times that newer, cheaper tech can be intimidating, leading us to stick to expensive, trusted solutions. I hope I've been able to demonstrate how easy it is to make use of such a great piece of kit for very little money. I don't know how the international market is doing, but in South Africa, model trains are incredibly expensive. 
By building this layout, I hope to show how much joy one can get from a few points and three pieces of flex track. I want to thank you all for your patience with my scratchy voice in this video. Um, it was a bit difficult recording, but I managed to get through all of it. Again, I want to say a huge thank you to Hilton from Proper Chuffed and to all of you that subscribe to my channel. If you haven't already, please like, subscribe and share. If you enjoyed the video or you got some value out of it, please feel free to leave a comment below. Until next time, go well and keep training.